Swan in Love Continued Swan begged to be introduced to everyone, even to the old friend of the Verdurin, called Sagnet, whose shyness, simplicity, and good nature had deprived him of all the consideration due to his skill in paleography, his large fortune, and the distinguished family to which he belonged. When he spoke, his words came with a confusion which was delightful to hear, because one felt that it indicated not so much a defect in his speech as a quality of his soul, as it were a survival from the age of innocence which he had never wholly outgrown. All the consonants which he did not manage to pronounce seemed like harsh utterances of which his gentle lips were incapable. By asking to be made known to M. Sagnet, Swann made M. Verdurin reverse the usual form of introduction, saying, in fact, with emphasis on the distinction, M. Swann, pray let me present to you our friend Sagnet. But he aroused in Sagnet himself a warmth of gratitude, which, however, the Verdurin never disclosed to Swann, since Sagnet rather annoyed them and they did not feel bound to provide him with friends. On the other hand, the Verdurin were extremely touched by Swann's next request, for he felt that he must ask to be introduced to the pianist's aunt. She wore a black dress, as was her invariable custom, for she believed that a woman always looked well in black, and that nothing could be more distinguished but her face was exceedingly red, as it always was for some time after a meal. She bowed to Swann with deference, but drew herself up again with great dignity. As she was entirely uneducated, and was afraid of making mistakes in grammar and pronunciation, she used purposely to speak in an indistinct and garbling manner, thinking that, if she should make a slip, it would be so buried in the surrounding confusion that no one could be certain whether she had actually made it or not, with the result that her talk was a sort of continuous blurred expectoration, out of which would emerge, at rare intervals, those sounds and syllables of which she felt positive. Swann supposed himself entitled to poke a little mild fun at her, in conversation with M. Verdurin, who, however, was not at all amused. "'She is such an excellent woman,' he rejoined. "'I grant you that she is not exactly brilliant, but I assure you that she can talk most charmingly when you are alone with her.' "'I am sure she can,' Swann hastened to conciliate him. "'All I meant was that she hardly struck me as distinguished, he went on, isolating the epithet in the inverted commas of his tone, and, after all, that is something of a compliment. Wait a moment, said M. Verdurin. Now, this will surprise you. She writes quite delightfully. You have never heard her nephew play. It is admirable, eh, doctor? Would you like me to ask him to play something, M. Swann? I should count myself most fortunate. Swann was beginning, a trifle pompously, when the doctor broke in derisively. Having once heard it said, and never having forgotten that in general conversation emphasis and the use of formal expressions were out of date, whenever he heard a solemn word used seriously, as the word fortunate had been used just now by Swann, he at once assumed that the speaker was being deliberately pedantic, and, if, moreover, the same word happened to occur also in what he called an old tag or saw, however common it might still be in current usage, the doctor jumped to the conclusion that the whole thing was a joke and interrupted with the remaining words of the quotation, which he seemed to charge the speaker with having intended to introduce at that point, although, in reality, it had never entered his mind.
Most fortunate for France, he recited wickedly, shooting up both arms with great vigor. Monsieur Verdurin could not help laughing. What are all those good people laughing at over there? There's no sign of brooding melancholy down in your corner, shouted Madame Verdurin. You don't suppose I find it very amusing to be stuck up here by myself on the stool of repentance? She went on peevishly, like a spoiled child. Madame Verdurin was sitting upon a high Swedish chair of waxed pine wood, which a violinist from that country had given her, and which she kept in her drawing room, although in appearance it suggested a school form, and swore, as the saying is, at the really good antique furniture which she had besides but she made a point of keeping on view the presents which her faithful were in the habit of making her from time to time, so that the donors might have the pleasure of seeing them there when they came to the house. She tried to persuade them to confine their tributes to flowers and sweets, which had at least the merit of mortality, but she was never successful and the house was gradually filled with a collection of foot-warmers, cushions, clocks, screens, barometers, and vases, a constant repetition, and a boundless incongruity of useless but indestructible objects. From this lofty perch she would take her spirited part in the conversation of the faithful, and would revel in all their fun. But, since the accident to her jaw, she had abandoned the effort involved in real hilarity, and had substituted a kind of symbolical dumb-show, which signified, without endangering or even fatiguing her in any way, that she was laughing until she cried. At the least witticism aimed by any of the circle against a bore, or against a former member of the circle who was now relegated to the limbo of boors, and to the utter despair of Monsieur Verdurin, who had always made out that he was just as easily amused as his wife, but who, since his laughter was the real thing, was out of breath in a moment, and so was overtaken and vanquished by her device of a feigned but continuous hilarity. She would utter a shrill cry, shut tight her little bird-like eyes, which were beginning to be clouded over by a cataract, and quickly, as though she had only just time to avoid some indecent sight, or to parry a mortal blow, burying her face in her hands, which completely engulfed it, and prevented her from saying anything at all, she would appear to be struggling to suppress to eradicate a laugh which, were she to give way to it, must inevitably leave her inanimate. So, stupefied with the gaiety of the faithful, drunken with comradeship, scandal, and asseveration, Madame Verdurin perched on her high seat, like a cage-bird whose biscuit has been steeped in mulled wine, would sit aloft and sob with fellow feeling. Meanwhile, M. Verdurin, after first asking Swann's permission to light his pipe, no ceremony here, you understand, we're all pals, went and begged the young musician to sit down at the piano. Leave him alone. Don't bother him. He hasn't come here to be tormented, cried Madame Verdurin. I won't have him tormented. But why on earth should it bother him, rejoined M. Verdurin. I'm sure Monsieur Swann has never heard the sonata in F-sharp, which we discovered. He is going to play us the pianoforte arrangement. No, 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 not my sonata, she screamed. I don't want to be made to cry until I get a cold in the head and neuralgia all down my face, like last time. Thanks very much. I don't intend to repeat that performance. You are all very kind and considerate. It is easy to see that none of you will have to stay in bed for a week, 
This little scene, which was reenacted as often as the young pianist sat down to play, never failed to delight the audience, as though each of them were witnessing it for the first time, as a proof of the seductive originality of the mistress, as she was styled, and of the acute sensitiveness of her musical ear. Those nearest to her would attract the attention of the rest, who were smoking or playing cards at the other end of the room, by their cries of, Hear, hear, which, as in parliamentary debates, showed that something worth listening to was being said. And next day they would commiserate with those who had been prevented from coming that evening, and would assure them that the little scene had never been so amusingly done. Well, all right, then, said M. Verdurin. He can play just the andante. Just the andante! How you do go on, cried his wife, as if it weren't just the andante that breaks every bone in my body. The master is really too priceless, just as though, in the ninth, he said, we need only have the finale, or just the overture, of the Meistersinger. The doctor, however, urged Madame Verdurin to let the pianist play, not because he supposed her to be malingering when she spoke of the distressing effects that music always had upon her, for he recognized the existence of certain neurasthenic states, but from his habit, common to many doctors, of at once relaxing the strict letter of a prescription, as soon as it appeared to jeopardize what seemed to him far more important, the success of some social gathering at which he was present, and of which his patient, whom he had urged for once to forget her dyspepsia or headache, formed an essential factor. "'You won't be ill this time, you'll find,' he told her, seeking at the same time to subdue her mind by the magnetism of his gaze. "'And if you are ill, we will cure you.' "'Will you, really?' Madame Verdurin spoke as though, with so great a favour and store for her, there was nothing for it but to capitulate. Perhaps, too, by dint of saying that she was going to be ill, she had worked herself into a state in which she forgot, occasionally, that it was all only a little scene, and regarded things, quite sincerely, from an invalid's point of view. For it may often be remarked that, invalids grow weary of having the frequency of their attacks depend always on their own prudence in avoiding them, and like to let themselves think that they are free to do everything that they most enjoy, although they are always ill after doing it, provided only that they place themselves in the hands of a higher authority, which, without putting them to the least inconvenience, can and will by uttering a word, or by administering a tabloid, set them once again upon their feet. Odette had gone to sit on a tapestry-covered sofa near the piano, saying to Madame Verdurin, I have my own little corner, haven't I? And Madame Verdurin, seeing Swann by himself upon a chair, made him get up. You're not at all comfortable there. Go along and sit by Odette. You can make room for Monsieur Swann there, can't you, Odette? What charming Beauvais, said Swann, stopping to admire the sofa before he sat down on it, and wishing to be polite. I am glad you appreciate my sofa, replied Madame Verdurin, and I warn you that if you expect ever to see another like it, you may as well abandon the idea at once. They never made any more like it. And these little chairs, too, are perfect marvels. You can look at them in a moment. The emblems in each of the bronze mouldings correspond to the subject of the tapestry on the chair. You know, you combine amusement with instruction when you look at them. I can promise you a delightful time, I assure you. Just look at the little border around the edges here. Look, look. 
the little vine on a red background in this one, the bear and the grapes. Isn't it well drawn? What do you say? I think they knew a thing or two about design. Doesn't it make your mouth water, this vine? My husband makes out that I am not fond of fruit, because I eat less than he does. But not a bit of it. I am greedier than any of you, but I have no need to fill my mouth with them, when I can feed on them with my eyes. What are you all laughing at now, pray? Ask the doctor. He will tell you that those grapes act on me like a regular purge. Some people go to the Fontainebleau for cures. I take my own little Beauvais cure here. But, Monsieur Swann, you mustn't run away without feeling the little bronze mouldings on the backs. Isn't it an exquisite surface? No, no, not with your whole hand like that. Feel them properly. If Madame Verdurin is going to start playing about her bronzes, said the painter, we shan't get any music tonight. Be quiet, you wretch, and yet we poor women— she went on, are forbidden pleasures far less voluptuous than this. There is no flesh in the world as soft as these. None. When Monsieur Verdurin did me the honour of being madly jealous, come, you might at least be polite. Don't say that you never have been jealous. But, my dear, I have said absolutely nothing. Look here, doctor, I call you as a witness. Did I utter a word? Swann had begun, out of politeness, to finger the bronzes, and did not like to stop. Come along, you can caress them later. Now it is you that are going to be caressed. Caressed in the ear. You'll like that, I think. Here's the young gentleman who will take charge of that. After the pianist had played, Swann felt and showed more interest in him than in any of the other guests for the following reason. The year before, at an evening party, he had heard a piece of music played on the piano and violin. At first he had appreciated only the material quality of the sounds which those instruments secreted, and it had been a source of keen pleasure when, Below the narrow ribbon of the violin part, delicate, unyielding, substantial, and governing the whole, he had suddenly perceived, where it was trying to surge upwards in a flowing tide of sound, the mass of the piano part, multiform, coherent, level, and breaking everywhere in melody like the deep blue tumult of the sea silvered and charmed with a minor key by the moonlight. But at a given moment, without being able to distinguish any clear outline, or to give a name to what was pleasing him, suddenly enraptured, he had tried to collect, to treasure in his memory, the phrase or harmony, he knew not which, that had just been played, and had opened and expanded his soul, just as the fragrance of certain roses wafted upon the moist air of evening has the power of dilating our nostrils. Perhaps it was owing to his own ignorance of music that he had been able to receive so confused an impression, one of those that are, notwithstanding, our only purely musical impressions, limited in their extent, entirely original, and irreducible, into any other kind. An impression of this order, vanishing in an instant, is, so to speak, an impression sine materia. Presumably, the notes which we hear at such moments tend to spread out before our eyes, over surfaces greater or smaller, according to their pitch and volume, to trace arabesque designs to give us the sensation of breath, or tenuity, stability, or caprice. But the notes themselves have vanished before these sensations 
have developed sufficiently to escape submersion under those which the following, or even simultaneous notes have already begun to awaken in us, and this indefinite perception would continue to smother in its molten liquidity the motifs which now and then emerge, barely discernible, to plunge again and disappear and to drown, recognized only by the particular kind of pleasure which they instill, impossible to describe, to recollect, to name, ineffable. If our memory, like a laborer who toils at the laying down of firm foundations beneath the tumult of the waves, did not, by fashioning for us facsimiles of those fugitive phrases, enable us to compare and to contrast them with those that follow. And so, hardly had the delicious sensation which Swann had experienced died away before his memory had furnished him with an immediate transcript, summary, it is true, and provisional, but one on which he had kept his eyes fixed while the plane continued, so effectively that, when the same impression suddenly returned, it was no longer uncapturable. He was able to picture to himself its extent, its symmetrical arrangement, its notation, the strength of its expression. He had before him that definite object which was no longer pure music, but rather design, architecture, thought, and which allowed the actual music to be recalled. This time he had distinguished quite clearly a phrase which emerged for a few moments from the waves of sound. It had at once held out to him an invitation to partake of intimate pleasures, of whose existence before hearing it he had never dreamed, into which he felt that nothing but this phrase could initiate him, and he had been filled with love for it, as with a new and strange desire. With a slow and rhythmical movement, it led him here, there, everywhere, towards a state of happiness, noble, unintelligible, yet clearly indicated and then suddenly, having reached a certain point from which he was prepared to follow it, after pausing for a moment, abruptly it changed its direction, and in a fresh movement, more rapid, multiform, melancholy, incessant, sweet, it bore him off with it towards a vista of joys unknown. Then it vanished. He hoped with a passionate longing, that he might find it again a third time, and reappear it did, though without speaking to him more clearly, bringing him, indeed, a pleasure less profound. But when he was once more at home, he needed it. He was like a man into whose life a woman, whom he has seen for a moment passing by, has brought a new form of beauty which strengthens and enlarges his own power of perception, without his knowing, even, whether he is ever to see her again, whom he loves already, although he knows nothing of her, not even her name. Indeed, this passion for a phrase of music seemed in the first few months to be bringing into Swann's life the possibility of a sort of rejuvenation, he had so long since ceased to direct his course towards any ideal goal, and had confined himself to the pursuit of ephemeral satisfactions, that he had come to believe, though without ever formally stating his belief even to himself, that he would remain all his life in that condition which death alone could alter. More than this, since his mind no longer entertained any lofty ideals, he had ceased to believe in, although he could not have expressly denied the reality. He had grown, also, into the habit of taking refuge in trivial considerations, 
which allowed him to set on one side matters of fundamental importance. Just as he had never stopped to ask himself whether he would not have done better by not going into society, knowing very well that if he had accepted an invitation he must put in an appearance, and that afterwards, if he did not actually call, he must at least leave cards upon his hostess. So, in his conversation, he took care never to express with any warmth a personal opinion about a thing, but instead would supply facts and details which had a value of a sort in themselves, and excused him from showing how much he really knew. He would be extremely precise about the recipe for a dish, the dates of a painter's birth and death, and the titles of his works. Sometimes, in spite of himself, he would let himself go so far as to utter a criticism of a work of art, or of someone's interpretation of life. But then he would cloak his words in a tone of irony, as though he did not altogether associate himself with what he was saying. But now, like a confirmed invalid, whom, all of a sudden, a change of air and surroundings, or a new course of treatment, or, as sometimes happens, an organic change in himself, spontaneous and unaccountable, seems to have so far recovered from his malady that he begins to envisage the possibility, hitherto beyond all hope, of starting to lead, and better late than never, a wholly different life. Swann found in himself, in the memory of the phrase that he had heard, in certain other sonatas which he had made people play over to him, to see whether he might not, perhaps, discover his phrase among them, the presence of one of those invisible realities in which he had ceased to believe, but to which, as though the music had had upon the moral barrenness from which he was suffering a sort of recreative influence, he was conscious once again of a desire, almost, indeed, of the power to consecrate his life. But, never having managed to find out whose work it was that he had heard played that evening, he had been unable to procure a copy, and finally had forgotten the quest. He had, indeed, in the course of the next few days, encountered several of the people who had been at the party with him, and had questioned them. But most of them had either arrived after, or left before the piece was played. Some had indeed been in the house, but had gone into another room to talk, and those who had stayed to listen had no clearer impression than the rest. As for his hosts, they knew that it was a recently published work, which the musicians, whom they had engaged for the evening, had asked to be allowed to play, but as these last were now on tour somewhere, Swann could learn nothing further. He had, of course, a number of musical friends, but vividly as he could recall the exquisite and inexpressible pleasure which the little phrase had given him, and could see still before his eyes the forms that it had traced in outline, he was quite incapable of humming over to them the air. And so, at last, he ceased to think of it. But to-night, at Madame Verdurin's, scarcely had the little pianist begun to play when, suddenly, after a high note held on through two whole bars, Swann saw it approaching, stealing forth from underneath that resonance, which was prolonged and stretched out over it, like a curtain of sound, to veil the mystery of its birth, and recognized, secret, whispering, articulate, the airy and fragrant phrase that he had loved. And it was so peculiarly itself, it had so personal a charm, 
which nothing else could have replaced, that Swan felt as though he had met in a friend's drawing-room a woman whom he had seen and admired once in the street, and had despaired of ever seeing her again. Finally the phrase withdrew and vanished, pointing, directing, diligent among the wandering currents of its fragrance, leaving upon Swan's features a reflection of its smile. But now, at last, he could ask the name of his fair unknown, and was told that it was the Andante movement of Van Teuil's sonata for the piano and violin. He held it safe, could have it again to himself at home, and as often as he would, could study its language and acquire its secret. And so, when the pianist had finished, Swan crossed the room and thanked him with a vivacity which delighted Madame Verdurin. "'Isn't he charming?' she asked Swan. "'Doesn't he just understand it, his sonata, the little wretch? "'You never dreamed, did you, that a piano could be made to express all that? "'Upon my word, there's everything in it except the piano. "'I'm caught out every time I hear it. "'I think I'm listening to an orchestra, "'though it's better, really, than an orchestra, more complete.' The young pianist bent over her as he answered, smiling and underlining each of his words, as though he were making an epigram. You are most generous to me. And while Madame Verdurin was saying to her husband, Run and fetch him a glass of orangeade. It's well earned. Swann began to tell Odette how he had fallen in love with that little phrase when their hostess, who was a little way off, called out, "'Well, it looks to me as though someone was saying nice things to you, Odette,' she replied. "'Yes, very nice,' and he found her simplicity delightful. Then he asked for some information about his vanteuil, what else he had done, and at what period in his life he had composed the sonata." what meaning the little phrase could have had for him. That was what Swann wanted most to know. But none of these people who professed to admire this musician, when Swann had said that the sonata was really charming, Madame Verdurin had exclaimed, I quite believe it charming, indeed, but you don't dare to confess that you don't know Van Tuy's sonata. You have no right not to know it. And the painter had gone on with, Ah, yes, it is a very fine piece of work, isn't it? Not, of course, if you want something obvious, something popular, but I mean to say it makes a very great impression on us artists. None of them seemed ever to have asked himself these questions, for none of them was able to reply. Even to one or two particular remarks made by Swann on his particular phrase, Do you know, that's a funny thing. I had never noticed it. I may as well tell you that I don't much care about peering at things through a microscope and pricking myself on pinpoints of difference. No, we don't waste time splitting hairs in this house. Why not? Well, it's not a habit of ours. That's all, Madame Verdurin replied, while Dr. Cotard gazed at her with open-mouthed admiration and yearned to be able to follow her as she skipped lightly from one stepping-stone to another of her stock of ready-made phrases. Both he, however, and Madame Cotard, with a kind of common sense which is shared by many people of humble origin, would always take care not to express an opinion, or to pretend to admire a piece of music which they would confess to each other once they were safely at home. They had no more understood than they could understand the art of Master Biche, inasmuch as the public cannot recognize the charm, the beauty, even the outlines of nature,
save in the stereotyped impressions of an art which they have gradually assimilated, while an original artist starts by rejecting those impressions. So Monsieur and Madame Cotard, typical in this respect of the public, were incapable of finding either in Van Thuy's sonata or in Biche's portraits what constituted harmony for them in music or beauty in painting. It appeared to them, when the pianist played his sonata, as though he were striking haphazard from the piano a medley of notes which bore no relation to the musical forms to which they themselves were accustomed, and that the painter simply flung the colors haphazard upon his canvas. When, on one of these, they were able to distinguish a human form, they always found it coarsened and vulgarized, that is to say, lacking all the elegance of the school of painting, through whose spectacles they themselves were in the habit of seeing the people, real living people, who passed them in the streets, and devoid of truth, as though M. Biche had not known how the human shoulder was constructed, or that a woman's hair was not, ordinarily, purple. And yet, when the faithful were scattered out of earshot, the doctor felt that the opportunity was too good to be missed, and so, while Madame Verdurin was adding a final word of commendation on Bantouille's sonata, like a would-be swimmer who jumps into the water so as to learn, but chooses a moment when there are not too many people looking on. Yes, indeed, he's what they call a musician di primo cartello, he exclaimed with a sudden determination. Swan discovered no more than that the recent publication of Vantuya's Sonata had caused a great stir among the most advanced school of musicians, but that it was still unknown to the general public. I know someone quite well, called Vantuya, said Swan, thinking of the old music master at Cambrai, who had taught my grandmother's sisters. Perhaps that's the man. Oh, no, Swan burst out laughing. If you had ever seen him for a moment, you wouldn't put the question. Then to put the question is to solve the problem, the doctor suggested. But it may well be some relative, Swan went on. That would be bad enough, but after all, there is no reason why a genius shouldn't have a cousin who is a silly old fool. And if that should be so, I swear there's no known or unknown form of torture I wouldn't undergo to get the old fool to introduce me to the man who composed the sonata, starting with the torture of the old fool's company, which would be ghastly. The painter understood that Van Thuy was seriously ill at the moment, and that Dr. Potin despaired of his life. What? cried Madame Verdurin. Do people still call in Potin? Ah, Madame Verdurin, Cotard simpered, you forget that you are speaking of one of my colleagues, I should say one of my masters. The painter had heard somewhere that Van Thuyer was threatened with the loss of his reason and he insisted that signs of this could be detected in certain passages in the sonata. This remark did not strike Swann as ridiculous. Rather, it puzzled him, for since a purely musical work contains none of those logical sequences, the interruption or confusion of which, in spoken or written language, is a proof of insanity, so insanity, diagnosed in a sonata, seemed to him as mysterious a thing as the insanity of a dog or a horse, although instances may be observed of these. Don't speak to me about your masters. You know ten times as much as he does, Madame Verdurin answered Dr. Cotard. 
in the tone of a woman who has the courage of her convictions, and is quite ready to stand up to anyone who disagrees with her. Anyhow, you don't kill your patients. But, madame, he is in the academy. The doctor smiled with bitter irony. If a sick person prefers to die at the hands of one of the princes of science, it is far more smart to be able to say, Yes, I have Potin. Oh, indeed, more smart, is it? said Madame Verdurin. So there are fashions nowadays in illness, are there? I didn't know that. Oh, you do make me laugh. She screamed suddenly, burying her face in her hands. And here was I, poor thing, talking quite seriously, and never seeing that you were pulling my leg. As for Monsieur Verdurin, finding it rather a strain to start laughing again over so small a matter, he was content with puffing out a cloud of smoke from his pipe, while he reflected sadly that he could never again hope to keep pace with his wife in her Atalanta flights across the field of mirth. Do you know, we like your friend so very much, said Madame Verdurin, later, when Odette was bidding her good night. He is so unaffected, quite charming. If they're all like that, the friends you want to bring here, by all means bring them. Monsieur Verdurin remarked that Swann had failed, all the same, to appreciate the pianist's aunt. I dare say he felt a little strange, poor man, suggested Madame Verdurin. You can't expect him to catch the tone of the house the first time he comes. Like Qatar, who has been one of our little clan now for years, the first time doesn't count. It's just for looking round and finding out things. Odette, he understands, all right. He's to join us tomorrow at the Châtelet. Perhaps you might call for him and bring him. No, he doesn't want that. Oh, very well, just as you like, provided he doesn't fail us at the last moment. Greatly, to Madame Verdurin's surprise, he never failed them. He would go to meet them, no matter where, at restaurants outside Paris. Not that they went there much at first, for the season had not yet begun, and more frequently at the play, in which Madame Verdurin delighted. One evening, when they were dining at home, he heard her complain that she had not one of those permits which would save her the trouble of waiting at doors and standing in crowds, and say how useful it would be to them at first nights, and gala performances at the opera, and what a nuisance it had been not having one on the day of Gambetta's funeral. Swann never spoke of his distinguished friends, but only of such as might be regarded as detrimental, whom, therefore, he thought it snobbish and in not very good taste to conceal. While he frequented the Faubourg Saint-Germain, he had come to include, in the latter class, all his friends in the official world of the Third Republic, and so broke in, without thinking, I'll see to that, all right. You shall have it in time for the Donachev revival. I shall be lunching with the prefect of police tomorrow, as it happens, at the Elysee. What's that? The Elysee? Dr. Cotard roared in a voice of thunder. Yes, at Monsieur Grevy's, replied Swann, feeling a little awkward at the effect which his announcement had produced. Are you often taken like that? the painter asked Cotard, with mock seriousness. As a rule, once an explanation had been given, Cotard would say, Ah, good, good, that's all right, then. After which he would show not the least trace of emotion. But this time, Swann's last words, instead of the usual calming effect, 
had that of heating instantly to boiling point his astonishment at the discovery that a man with whom he himself was actually sitting at table a man who had no official position no honours or distinction of any sort was on visiting terms with the head of the state what's that you say monsieur grevy do you know monsieur grevy he demanded of swann in the stupid and incredulous tone of a constable on duty at the palace when a stranger has come up and asked to see the president of the republic until guessing from his words and manner what as the newspapers say it is a case of he assures the poor lunatic that he will be admitted at once and points the way to the reception ward of the police infirmary i know him slightly we have some friends in common swann dared not add that one of those friends was the prince of wales anyhow he is very free with his invitations and i assure you his luncheon parties are not the least bit amusing they're very simple affairs too you know never more than eight at table he went on trying desperately to cut out everything that seemed to show off his relations with the president in a light too dazzling for the doctor's eyes whereupon cottard at once conforming in his mind to the literal interpretation of what swann was saying decided that invitations from m griffy were very little sought after were sent out in fact into the highways and hedgerows and from that moment he never seemed at all surprised to hear that swann or any one else was always at the lsa he even felt a little sorry for a man who had to go to luncheon parties which he himself admitted were a bore ah good good that's quite all right then he said in the tone of a customs official who had been suspicious up to now but after hearing your explanations stamps your passport and lets you proceed on your journey without troubling to examine your luggage i can well believe that you don't find them amusing those parties indeed it's very good of you to go to them said madame verdurin who regarded the president of the republic only as a bore to be especially dreaded since he had at his disposal means of seduction and even of compulsion which if employed to captivate her faithful might easily make them fail it seems he's as deaf as a post and eats with his fingers upon my word then it can't be much fun for you going there a note of pity sounded in the doctor's voice and then struck by the number only eight at table are these luncheons what you would describe as intimate he inquired briskly not so much out of idle curiosity as in his linguistic zeal but so great and glorious a figure was the president of the french republic in the eyes of dr cottard that neither the modesty of swann nor the spite of madame verdurin could ever wholly efface that first impression and he never sat down to dinner with the verdurin without asking anxiously do you think we shall see m swann this evening he is a personal friend of m grevy's i suppose that means he's what you'd call a gentleman he even went to the length of offering swann a card of invitation to the dental exhibition this will let you in and any one you take with you he explained but dogs are not admitted i'm just warning you you understand because some friends of mine went there once who hadn't been told and there was the devil to pay as for m verdurin he did not fail to observe the distressing effect upon his wife of the discovery that swann had influential friends of whom he had never spoken if no arrangement had been made to go anywhere 
It was at the Verderins that Swann would find the little nucleus assembled, but he never appeared there except in the evenings, and would hardly ever accept their invitations to dinner, in spite of Odette's entreaties. I could dine with you alone somewhere, if you'd rather, she suggested. But what about Madame Verderin? Oh, that's simple. I need only say that my dress wasn't ready, or that my cab came late. There is always some excuse. How charming of you! But Swann said to himself that if he could make Odette feel, by consenting to meet her only after dinner, that there were other pleasures which he preferred to that of her company, then the desire that she felt for his would be all the longer in reaching the point of satiety. Besides, as he infinitely preferred to Odette's style of beauty, that of a little working girl as fresh and plump as a rose, with whom he happened to be simultaneously in love, he preferred to spend the first part of the evening with her, knowing that he was sure to see Odette later on. For the same reason, he would never allow Odette to call for him at his house, to take him on to the Verderins. The little girl used to wait, not far from his door at a street corner. Remy, his coachman, knew where to stop. She would jump in beside him, and hold him in her arms until the carriage drew up at the Verderin. He would enter the drawing-room, and there, while Madame Verderin, pointing to the roses which he had sent her that morning, said, I am furious with you, and sent him to the place kept for him, by the side of Odette. The pianist would play for them, for their two selves and for no one else. That little phrase by Manteuil, which was, so to speak, the national anthem of their love. He began, always, with a sustained tremolo from the violin part, which for several bars was unaccompanied, and filled all the foreground, until, suddenly, it seemed to be drawn aside, and, just as in those interiors by Peter de Hoche, where the subject is set back a long way through the narrow framework of a half-opened door, infinitely remote, in color quite different, velvety with the radiance of some intervening light, the little phrase appeared, dancing, pastoral, interpolated, episodic, belonging to another world. It passed with simple and immortal movements, scattering on every side the bounties of its grace, smiling ineffably still. But Swann thought that he could now discern in it some disenchantment. It seemed to be aware how vain, how hollow was the happiness to which it showed the way. In its airy grace, there was, indeed, something definitely achieved and complete in itself, like the mood of philosophic detachment which follows an outburst of vain regret. But little did that matter to him. He looked upon the sonata less in its own light, as what it might express, had, in fact, expressed to a certain musician, ignorant that any swan or odette anywhere in the world existed when he composed it and would express to all those who should hear it played in centuries to come then as a pledge a token of his love which made even the verderin and their little pianist think of odette and at the same time of himself which bound her to him by a lasting tie, and at that point he had, whimsically entreated by Odette, abandoned the idea of getting some professional to play over to him the whole sonata, of which he still knew no more than this one passage. Why do you want the rest? she had asked him, 
our little bit. That's all we need. He went farther, agonized by the reflection at the moment when it passed by him, so near and yet so infinitely remote, that while it was addressed to their ears, it knew them not. He would regret almost that it had a meaning of its own, an intrinsic and unalterable beauty foreign to themselves, just as in the jewels given to us, or even in the letters written to us by a woman with whom we are in love, we find fault with the water of a stone, or with the words of a sentence, because they are not fashioned exclusively from the spirit of a fleeting intimacy, and of a lass unparalleled. End of section 16. Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California.